Welcome to another moment in the Word. What is your purpose in the world as a Christian? Why didn't Jesus just simply take you home soon as you received him as your Savior and as your Lord? Why is it that he has retained you in this world? Well, you came to know Christ because someone had introduced you to him. Someone had opened the word of God to you. And as a result, you are a Christian. Your job now is to do the same, is to share the word of God, to make disciples, he says. We find that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount has described his disciples in two ways. He has said that you are the salt of the earth. And so we find that salt has a penetrating value. It preserves. It's good for medicinal value. The Roman soldiers were paid in salt. That's where we got our English word salary from. It means to receive their salt. And if they didn't work, they were not worth their salt. But salt is of no value if it's kept in the salt shaker. It has to be spilled out. It has to be poured into the world. Salt is a preventative. Salt acts not immediately, but very slow and imperceptibly. But Jesus then goes from saying, your mission is as salt that is retarding the putrefaction of the world to then saying, your light. Light is very different than salt. Salt, again, is slow, imperceptive. Light is immediate and very aggressive. And so here's what Jesus says. It's in Matthew and in chapter 5, verses 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a lampstand that it gives light. To unto all that are in the house, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Notice he says, just like in verse 13, you and you only. It's emphatic in the Greek. You and you only are the salt of the earth. You, and in verse 14, and you only are the light of the world. In other words, if the believer is taken out of the world, the world would be in abject darkness. And therefore, you're the light of the world. But notice he makes a contrast between the world and the earth. When he says in verse 13, the salt is the salt of the earth, sin not only destroys humanity and the individual, it affects all of creation. Adam's sin in the garden subjected all of creation unto vanity, it says in Romans chapter 8. And thereby the earth, you're the salt of the earth, your life in the way in which it penetrates the world affects not only humanity, it affects all of creation. And the same now as we look at you're the light of the world. When we speak of the world, the cosmos, now we're talking about people. And notice he has three realms in which the light affects. It first affects the world, then the city, and finally the house. Notice he says that it affects the world. That light that is in you changes and affects the world. Now, in what way? Well, we saw that the light, the first time it's ever used in the Bible, is back in Bershit, in Genesis, chapter 1, verse 3. The darkness was upon the face of the deep, and God called forth, didn't create, called forth the Zohar, the light. He calls forth the light, and that light is what brought symmetry, what brought harmony, what brought creation. And we know that in Colossians, uh, Colossians chapter 2, that all creation was made by Jesus. Without him was not anything made. It is made by him who is the light. Now we also see in John chapter 1, where that light is Christ, and his life is is the light that comes into the world. It's his life that brings light. And then it says, this light 
overcame the darkness. It didn't comprehend it. It doesn't control it. It is light that always defeats darkness. It is never darkness. You can't have enough darkness to defeat the light. And that is precisely what happens. Jesus says in John chapter 8, I am the light of the world, and that he who comes to him will not walk in darkness. You will not stumble because he is the life that gives light. And as the word of God is a lamp to your feet and a light to your pathway, it gives direction. The light exposes what was in the dark. So you know what's there. You know what to avoid. You know where to walk. And the lamp that is the word of God, remember Jesus is the word that became flesh. That word is as a foot lamp. It gives you enough light for the next step that you're taking so that as you're walking through the world, you may be wondering today, what do I do? How do I behave? What do I think? How do I speak? All of those things can be guided by the Word of God because the Word is God's expression of Himself, of His heart and His mind for you. Jesus is the Word that became flesh, and that Word now has revealed Himself in such a way that you know how to live. This is the light that lights every man that comes into the world. Have you received that light? You can reject the light. You can say, no, I want the darkness. Men love darkness, Jesus said to Nicodemus, because their deeds are evil. That's why they persist in the darkness. But is that the case for you? Or do you say, as we saw in the Beatitudes, my life is poor in spirit, and I grieve the sin that darkness has wrought in me. Thereby, I want to serve him. And if that is the case, then you are as a city that's on a hill, a city that is prominent. You stand out. There is an enduring city, that city of Jerusalem that is the eternal city, that city from which creation began and which the Holy Spirit came into the believer and transformed and made a new creation. That city is eternal. But that city is also a picture of the believer himself who is a part of the new Jerusalem and that you are that city that is set on a hill. You are the ones that God is using in a prominent position. It doesn't mean that necessarily you live in Jerusalem. You may live in a small village, but your life is as a prominent figure. And then he goes on to say that you're not only a light to the world, but you're a city that's set on a hill. So you're not only a light to the world, you're a light to your community. And then you're as a lamp that is to the whole of the family, of the household. So you're a light in your family. Those three ways are also the three ways, and notice the ascending order. The last is the most important. If you're not a light in your family, in your home, then you will not be a light in your community. With a light that shines the furthest will shine the brightest in its home. And so therefore, ask yourself, is my light in my home one that brings glory to God? Now, how do you do that? Well, we find that that lamp first of all, is as a lamp that we see in the Old Testament commonly used. It was made out of clay. Isn't that what your life is? Our bodies are as clay. Dust thou art, to dust thou shalt return. But within the clay is oil that God has poured, and that oil that pours into us then goes through and out a wick, and that wick is then what burns. It takes the oil from within and then illuminates all that it's around. Your life 
is then that wick that is burning, and it is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to, you to know that that happens when you receive Jesus as your Savior. When you receive him as Savior and Lord, you've acknowledged your sin. It's at that point you receive the Holy Spirit. And if you have not the Holy Spirit, you're none of his. And yet that same Holy Spirit seals you to the day of redemption. So you now have the Spirit of God dwelling within you. That wick then is then to be left trimmed. That trimming means anything that is hindering the, the effulgence, the radiance of Christ in your life needs to be removed. That's why it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and then be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you, a reason for the hope that lies within you. But it begins with sanctification. It begins with cleansing the wick. The wick is what needs to be continually cleansed and that you are yielding to the Spirit of God, allowing yourself to be continually filled by Him. As a result, it says, you're to let your light so shine before men. Now, what is that light? That light is the life of Christ in you. Notice what it says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, that we're not saved by works. No, it's not our works. We're not trying to earn our way to heaven, but neither can we by good works give glory to God. It is not our works. It's his works. For then it says in verse 10, we are his workmanship. We're his poem that is created in Christ Jesus unto good works. It's not my talent or my ability, but him using me, you, to his glory. And as others look and you at you, they see something in you and they know it's not you. They know there's something greater than you. They know that that life that is in you is a life of Christ, and thereby they give glory to the Father. And it's what it says. Let your good works, your good works out of a good life that has been transformed, and thereby you give glory to the Father which is in heaven. I want to remind you that the symbol of Israel is not the star of David in reality. It has been from ancient times always the menorah, the menorah has seven candles, but the middle candle is called the shamus, and the shamus is the servant. And it is from this point in which the Holy Spirit, or the oil, is poured, and it fills up then the other six parts. Isn't that beautiful and a picture of us? I take you now to the last time that we find light mentioned in the Bible. We found it mentioned in Bershe chapter 1 and verse 3, and now we find it in the book of Revelation in chapter 21. And it says, The city had no need for the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God did light it. And the glory of God is in you. The glory of God is the Shekinah glory. The, sh the Shekinah glory in you that comes through Christ, that comes then to the other parts. And in you, as a result, it gives glory and light to all around. And it says it did light it, and the Lamb is the lamp of it. He is the one that is the receptacle of the light, the effulgence of the glory of the Godhead bodily. And then we find in chapter 22, the last chapter of the Bible, and we find that he is the light, verse 5, and there shall be no night there, that is in heaven, and there is no need of a lamp, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. Who is them? That's you. That is every single believer, every believer from Abel on, all those who have received him, and they shall reign forever and ever with the Lamb. 
O oh, my dear one, I pray that you have received the light, that your life has been transformed, that you were once as clay but made as salt, and now that you were in darkness but now made light, you were in death but now given life, and that life has so changed you that it just automatically shines. I want you to shine for Jesus today. I pray you do. Let's pray. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you for the light that has lit our lives, has revealed our sin, and has revealed your love, and has revealed to us who Jesus is. We thank you, Father, that you transformed us. You've made us new creations. And now, Father, we give glory to you. May our light so shine before men today that they see your good works and they glorify the Father. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.